Stanford University. So it's a great joy uh, to be here to talk to you about a subject that's close to my heart and uh, has uh, recently gotten some press in, um, in the form that you see uh, the cover uh, showing right up there. And I guess one of the major themes of the book could be summarized by a cliche I grew up with. It hurts to be beautiful is how my mother explained girdles, high heels, and a host of other practices uh, that have grown even more restrictive over time. There's a couple of illustrations. But it wasn't really until I finished research on this book did I fully appreciate how much it hurts also not to be beautiful, or at least minimally attractive as the culture defines it. And although discrimination based on appearance is by no means our most serious form of bias, its impact is a lot more invidious than we suppose. I don't want to come off as being against beauty um, or its positive aspects, including the pleasure that comes from self-expression and the health benefits that are sometimes prompted by appearance-related concerns, and the bump that some folks are happy to get from it, although, regrettably, it's not my experience since all those achievements you just heard um, never include anything like uh, widely known as a piece of work or the functional equivalent. But, but um, setting that aside, I do want to spend some time talking about the price we pay for an undue emphasis on attractiveness and some strategies we need to address it. I think part of what makes the issue so important is the unwillingness of so many Americans, including legal scholars and policymakers, to take our failure seriously. And in fact, of all the major problems that the women's movement has targeted, those related to appearance have really shown the least improvement over the last half century. And in fact, by some measures, such as the rise in cosmetic surgery and eating disorders, our preoccupation with attractiveness is getting worse. About half of all women uh, in this room, if you are typical of the nation generally, are unhappy with your body. And that's a figure that's higher than it was 25 years ago. And apart from money, appearance is the greatest source of women's dissatisfaction. Since the subject is large and my time is short and I want to leave plenty of time for conversation, I'm just going to give you a brief summary of some of the themes uh, in the book and leave most of our time for dialogue. So let me start with a few words about the importance of appearance. Beauty may only be skin deep, but that's plenty deep enough to confer an unsettling array of advantages. The book summarizes a cottage industry of research showing how much appearance skews judgments about competence and character traits. To take just a couple of illustrations relevant to my own profession, attractive teachers get better course evaluations from students. Attractive students get higher ratings on intelligence from teachers. Good-looking lawyers are more likely to be hired promoted and earn higher salaries, and it is no accident that many companies operate with this view. Um, let's put our best looking people on it. Given these advantages, it makes sense for individuals to be concerned about their appearance, but still the concern, uh, the extent of the concern is quite striking. 90% of women consider looks important to their self-image. Over a third rank it above job performance and intelligence. More than half of young women report that they would rather be hit by a truck than be fat, and two thirds would rather be mean or stupid. The preoccupation begins early. Here's the infant <laughs> worrying about her butt. And with good reason, because attractive children are viewed as more intelligent, likable, and good, and unattractive children face ostracism. Parents can inadvertently compound the problems by reinforcing pressure to conform. Uh, here's one of my favorite historic examples going back to uh, good housekeeping. A moral mother's duty is to help her child keep that schoolgirl complexion. And you see variations on that theme over the next half century. 
Child beauty pageants represent the logical extension of these attitudes. It's now a billion dollar industry pumping out professionalized, sexualized images of five to 10 year olds with elaborate makeup, hair extension, even false teeth and eyelashes. And even toddlers now can get into the competition. And a hot selling t-shirt for teens captures those same priorities asking, why have brains when you can have these? Women's magazines, of course, reinforce the message with endless advice on thinner thighs in 30 days and promises of how to look younger by morning. Even niche magazines now have a sprinkling of that kind of assistance. So in the evangelical uh, magazine genre, you can learn how to pray your way to way and achieve more of Jesus, less of me. Older women get 59 ways to more radiant skin, and tabloids, of course, compound the problem with photos like these. Men are subject to less pressure, but they're frequent victims of bias based on height and apparent masculinity. And you see some of the trends over time in this slide. I think the controversies over British singing sensation Susan Boyle's decision to get a makeover points up the double standard and double bind confronting prominent women. Initially, you may remember, Boyle resisted suggestions that she should spruce up her image. Why should it matter as long as I can sing, she asked one British interviewer. For now, I'm happy the way I am, short and plump. What's wrong with looking like Susan Boyle? Well, she soon found out. And when she invested in some modest correctives, a decent haircut and eyebrows shaped, here's the before and after, it set off a feeding frenzy in the tabloids and blogs. Amanda Holden, pictured on the bottom there, one of the judges in Britain's Got Talent, insisted that Boyle shouldn't uh, get the makeover. The minute we turn her into a glamour puss is when it's spoiled, she said. This advice, Ellen Goodman noted in her column, came from someone pretty blonde, Botoxed, and burnished, a glamour puss herself. All this social pressure prods greater expenditures on appearance than the results often justify. In financial terms, our annual global investment in grooming totals at least $200 billion. Americans alone spend $40 billion just on diets each year. The nation doles out more money on beauty than on education or social services, and cosmetic surgery is the fastest growing area of medical specialties. Much of this investment, of course, falls short of its intended effect. Um, here's a victim or survivor of cosmetic surgery who <laughs> finds that when she laughs, the wrinkles go in weird directions. 95% of dieters regain their weight within five years, and billions of dollars are squandered on beauty projects products that dermatologists label cosmetic hoo-ha. What we do know, as this spy advertisement tells us, is that the system will cleanse you of all your excess money. Discrimination on the basis of appearance also has both individual and social costs. Grooming codes may seem trivial inconvenience, high heels, for example, but 80% of women have foot or back problems largely due to their, um, to their footwear. And here's Vicky becoming another victim to accessories. Many individuals experience deeply wounding humiliation and bias that undermines self-esteem and compromises merit principles. And the bias on appearance really compounds other inequalities based on class, race, ethnicity, and gender. So, for example, women face greater pressure than men to be attractive and greater penalties to, for falling short. And they can be punished for being too attractive as well as not attractive enough. Very beautiful or sexy women are subject to what sociologists term the boopsie effect. They're assumed to be insufficiently intelligent for upper level positions. Here's the example of the woman who claimed she recently lost a Citibank job because her male <coughs> colleagues found her figure and fashion too distracting. As a result of this double standard and double bind, women spend vastly more time and money on appearance, their self-worth is tied more to physical attractiveness, and overweight women are judged much more harshly than overweight men. Um, 
Uh, she may not uh, be able to cook and ask who cares, but society in general does care. It expects women to conform, and yet it mocks the vanity of their efforts when they try. Here's someone in Victoria's Secret looking for something somewhat less empowering. So the question then becomes, well, is any of this unjust? Or is this just part of life? Um, kind of after 15 years of high heels and ulcers, barefoot and pregnant, pretty good. <laughs> or do some of these problems call for some sort of societal response? And as will not surprise you, since I'm a legal scholar, I'm on the side of a response, and one beyond what the law already supplies. Now, in all but a few jurisdictions, appearance discrimination is unlawful only if it's linked with characteristics that other civil rights law covers, such as race, sex, or disability. So, for example, grooming standards are impermissible only if they impose unreasonable, disproportionate burdens on one's sex. Now, the problem here is how courts interpret what's uh, reasonable or unequal. In one celebrated case, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals saw absolutely no gender discrimination in a code that required makeup, manicures, and styled hair for female bartenders, but only short hair and neatly trimmed nails for the male bartenders. Um, and here you see sort of what she looked like and what they were after. Other examples include grooming policies that require appropriate footwear, which are gender neutral in form, but hardly in fact, when men get comfortable walking shoes and women get what we call diplomatically in high school, uh, killer heels, and my own favorite cartoon from the collection, 10th <laughs> Circuit, Cir Circle of Hell, Lady Shoes, Haven't We All Been There? The clearest argument for broader prohibitions on appearance discrimination is that they offend principles of equal opportunity and individual dignity, and they impose substantial financial and psychological costs. Our preoccupation also reinforces invidious stereotypes and group disadvantages. Take bias based on weight, which is a pervasive form of discrimination, since most of us are pretty much in this category, weighing five pounds more than we'd like, or maybe somewhat more than five pounds than we'd like. But for some individuals, that kind of weight bias can make the difference between getting and keeping a job. Like the overweight man who was rejected for a position as a short order chef at McDonald's, where he had no customer contact. Why shouldn't the job selection depend on how he cooks, not how he looks? Those most affected by weight discrimination are those without the time and resources to invest in their appearance, poor and minority applicants. Not everyone can afford uh, health clubs, and many low-income individuals live in nutritional and recreational deserts without adequate access to fresh produce or public recreational facilities. Their help with weight loss, to the extent that they get it, looks somewhat more like this, and not all of them manage to drop the 12 pounds. Employers often defend discrimination based on appearance because it responds to customer preferences. As one Hooters spokesperson put it, a lot of places sell good burgers, but Hooters is offering along with them some all-American sex appeal. Of course, these were the same kinds of arguments that were made by business owners in the South in opposing civil rights legislation in the 1950s and 60s. After all, their white customers didn't want to buy from blacks or sit at the same lunchroom counter. And the same arguments were made again in the 1970s by the airlines who were defending their grooming codes and their bans on hiring men as flight attendants. Male business travelers, they said, prefer slender female stewardesses in hot pants. Um, and indeed, they did. But courts rightly rejected those customer preferences as a defense to discrimination since they reflected exactly the kind of prejudice that the statute was meant to overcome. They should now, I think, treat attractiveness or sexualized appearance requirements the same unless really sex is the essence of what's being sold. So reasonable grooming requirements, fine, but demanding cleavage with burgers, not so good. Contrary to conventional wisdom, discrimination based on appearance appears at least as widespread as other forms of prohibited bias, 
and many Americans believe something should be done about it. About the same percentage of workers report being victims of appearance discrimination as sex or race discrimination, and that's a higher proportion than those reporting age, religious, or ethnic bias. When asked about legal remedies, the responses split about evenly for or against prohibitions, and half the public, at least in this context, can see the point of this cartoon. Yeah, well, it's not necessarily going to be today, but someday you guys will be happy we took a round along a lawyer. And in appearance discrimination lawsuits, I think you'd see the same kind of public support if Americans knew more about how such prohibitions on appearance discrimination actually work. I looked at the handful of jurisdictions that now have ordinances that ban some form of appearance bias. And contrary to critics' concern, I found that these uh, localities haven't experienced a barrage of loony litigation or an erosion of support for civil rights statutes generally. Cities and counties that have some kind of ban on appearance discrimination average between zero and nine complaints a year. Michigan is the one state that has a height and weight um, discrimination ban. It gets only about 30 complaints. Only one of those ends up in court. Given the costs and difficulties of proving bias and the limited remedies available, enforcement just isn't um, a huge burden and is much less costly than opponents uh, have feared. So there are a lot of reasons in many contexts to stay away from the legal system, unless, of course, you're a lawyer. But in this particular context, you don't see a huge cost to having these ordinances. That, of course, means that they're also somewhat less effective than supporters have hoped. The jurisdictions that have um, these forms of prohibition uh, still have many uh, examples of this. Um, person who still can't walk in the shoes, which is a problem because she can't sit in the skirt either. Still, the laws have had some positive impact in remedying, publicizing, and hopefully deterring invidious bias. A good recent example is the case brought in Michigan, some of you may have heard about, of, by a Hooters waitress who was put on weight probation even though she was 5 foot 8 inches and weighed a pretty reasonable 130 pounds. She claims she was advised to join a gym to fit into her uniform which came in only three sizes, small, extra small, and extra, extra small. This, of course, at a restaurant chain that styles itself as family friendly. We need more such remedies and more expansive interpretations of existing anti-discrimination legislation. But law is only part of the solution. And in the final chapter of the book, I argue for broader cultural strategies to promote more attainable, healthy, and inclusive ideals for appearance. The ideal is not exactly this, a world without men and lots of fat, happy women, um, but it is a set of social norms that reflect much greater variation across age, weight, race, and ethnicity, and grooming requirements that allow much greater tolerance for diversity and self-expression. We need more diversity in, of images in the, um, those images that we value. And law, I think, can further that agenda. For example, by preventing employers from banning cornrows on African Americans and earrings on pet supply workers who are men. Or for requiring mascara and killer shoes for female waitresses absent a, a, a persuasive business necessity. But we need a lot of other strategies as well consumer protests, policy initiatives targeted not just at bias, but at unsafe or fraudulent products and marketing practices. There are far too many um, exaggerated product claims that are out there now that are on the fringes of fraud or one step over, but that no enforcement agency has the funds to actually enforce. We also need to do more to stamp out the kind of um, comment on the airwaves uh, facing, for example, Supreme Court nominee Elena Kagan. What do Janet Napolitano, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan all have in common? They look like linebackers for the New York Jets, said Jason Matera, editor-in-chief of humanevents.com. Uh, and that image and accompanying joke expresses the same kind of uh, 
uh, a slur that um, recently went my viral in the slide here. Why are Republican men happier? Look on the left um, and compare it to the most unflattering photos you can find of Democratic politicians on the right. All of this raises my question, why do women like Napolitano, Sotomayor, and Kagan have to put up with comments like these? And even more to the point, what in our culture makes commentators like talk show Michael Savage feel entitled to comment that Kagan looks like she belongs in a kosher deli? Attractiveness is not exactly a qualification for judicial office, and not all male justices are, how to put it uh, nicely, eye candy. Uh, but their contributions didn't trigger this um, kind of ridicule during the Senate hearings. I think those comments about um, Kagan and other cabinet officials are part of a quite long tradition of taking down uppity women. Some of you may recall during Hillary Clinton's Senate campaign, there were panelists on Larry King's lives who described her as fat and bottom heavy. This coming from uh, a man who, not himself, exactly a looker. And during their presidential campaign, Rush Limbaugh asked whether Americans will really want to watch a woman get older before their eyes on a daily basis. Men, of course, gain gravitas with their age. Women risk ridicule for trying too hard or not hard enough. I got a bit of a personal window into the bias I was writing about when this book hit the stand. Uh, there was no picture on the back cover, but this didn't stop a lot of people from drawing the obvious assumption. And it was surprising how many men took time out of their busy days to send me hate mail along the lines of, you ugly, expletive deleted. Or, my favorite, let's take up a collection to buy the professor a burqa and improve the aesthetics at Stanford. <laughs> well, beauty may only be skin deep, but the damages associated with its pursuit go much deeper. We need greater respect for choice and fewer social pressures on its exercise, so fewer people are going to worry about, well, that it still looks like me. Addressing these issues effectively will require treating appearance as a legal and a political as well as a personal issue. It's also going to require seeing discrimination as part of a broader um, uh, problem of bias, and we could talk about many of the illustrations that get higher billing in my course on gender law and policy. But I just want to close with, some, uh, with one obvious point, and a thank you to all of you, not just for showing up today and indicating that you care about the issue, but supporting a university that makes research like this possible. Um, this book, I had reason to count lately, has um, 1,100 citations. And you don't get the ability to do this kind of scholarship and then have the time and luxury to present it in a more palatable form unless you have the support of institutions like Stanford with a wonderful reference library, terrific students, and research assistants. So thanks to all of you for making opportunities like this possible. And I now want to just open it up to your questions, um, thoughts, and comments. Yes, all the way in the back. Uh, they have, um, and you know, religious institutions pretty much get a pass. Um, but but they've been tested in other contexts by commercial establishments, um, and also by in some cases involving questions of constitutional violations when the bans are imposed by state, uh, um, uh, often law enforcement agencies. So you know, no facial hair on firemen or police. Why? Uh, and it's particularly, I think, now problematic when you see the bans being forced against Muslims, and I've got a whole little collection of that, by commercial establishments who sir, just assert without any proof that it's inconsistent with their business image. Uh, there was one case involving a fast uh, food chain that uh, fired a, a, 
a Muslim employee that, who just had a small goatee on, quote, health grounds, on some sort of theory that that was, was going to interfere. You know. He didn't even have any direct contact with food processing. He was a manager. Um, but they thought it might convey the image of somehow unsafe eating practices. You know, who knows what the linkage was there, but the court swallowed it. And I think it's those kinds of cases where some kind of prohibition on appearance-related bias, unless you can justify a standard that's related to legitimate business reasons, would be important. And you see a lot of other examples where there's a racial and ethnic um, subtext to, to what the grooming codes require. I mean, I gave the cornrows example, but many others. Yes? Yeah, sure. <laughs> now we're going to take that into account in evaluating whatever comes next. But go ahead. I'm interested in the sort of the race element of the analysis of the grooming guide. For instance, you know, in the two cases you just cited, the employer test, the employer test is just set up in a way to make the company responsible. Yeah. We're not to say we're not responsible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that's, we all see the slippery slope. Um, and that's what the critics of these ordinances say. But, you know, in the places that actually have these ordinances, it never happens. Nobody comes in and says, I'm ugly, I was fired. They come in and they say, I didn't get a franchise to be an aerobic instructor because uh, I weigh too much according to the company. And the company concedes it and then says, yeah, she doesn't project the image of fit and tone that we like. Well, it turns out she was fit and toned. Um, she just was overweight. And she had no trouble attracting students. And when she brought suit under the San Francisco ordinance, uh, there was just this public outcry in her support by women saying, you know, we'd like to take a class from someone who looks like us. Um, and that forced the company to change the policy. And the reason why I use that example is, I think, a particularly positive illustration is because it's tremendously important in a culture where we now know that, that what really is a much bigger contributor to health problems is not weight, per se, but fitness and nutrition. To get the message out that fitness at any size is what we want, and it shouldn't just be body mass. I also the, um, like that example because it was a low-cost way of resolving that dispute. Nobody went to court. The complaint came before the San Francisco Discrimination Commission. And you're not going to get rich on these cases. Almost none of them end up in court. And nobody's hiring a battle of the experts. There's not enough money at stake. Also, it turns out that most of the complaints that are brought, people include other um, discrimination claims along with them. So even in the jurisdictions that have these ordinances that include appearance as part of what the civil rights law covers, most people allege also age or race or ethnicity. So it's not clear that eliminating this is going to you know, um, significantly change the, the response rates here. Yes? You know, it, it, that's such a great question. Could everybody hear it? You know, um, does beauty vary across cultures, essentially? And what does the research um, show about that? What the research shows is that there are some cultural variations over time and culture. Uh, for example, weight is one of them. In different periods in history, people's preferences for, um, for plumpness uh, have often been higher than they are in ours. Ironically enough, it seems to be related, those variations are related to status. And so whatever is harder to obtain is what's more valued. So in other words, in countries where you have chronic food shortages or in times in history when um, you've had many, many members of the population unable to, 
to get enough to eat. Those are the cultures that value plumpness. In our culture of overabundance, what we value is thinness. And um, there, although there are some differences in preferences across culture, there's a much stronger basis for, um, for agreement than we often expect. So there's widespread agreement across time and culture on facial symmetry, on certain things like good complexion, hair, that are signals of reproductive health. So it's got a kind of biological underpinning. And even things like skin color, um, we're now moving towards an increasingly globalized world. And the ideal is becoming a more Anglo-American, light-skinned um, norm that gets exported um, well beyond our borders. So that's why skin whiteners have such a huge sales in Africa. And um, light skin is valued even among dark skin uh, racial populations. One of the areas of highest growth in cosmetic surgery is eye surgery for Asians who want to have more of an Anglo appearance. All of that, I think, we should find quite alarming. So, so we're seeing an increasing homogenization. Yes? That's what I showed, yes, that, that bartender case. That was it. I want to know, is, is there hope for changing that here? Is it going to come down the way I want it to? Well, that's why I'm arguing for ordinances or for at least a more reasonable interpretation of the rules that we now have. And, you know, that case is very hard to understand on pure sex discrimination grounds because, you know, do we really need. Um, what the court said in that case, this was the bartender case, is there was no evidence in the courts below that the standards uh, for women imposed greater burdens, even though the standards required manicures, daily poofing and you know, hairstyling, um, and makeup. And all the men had to do was you know, have their nails neatly trimmed. And a couple of the dissenting judges, this went up to an en banc panel, which for those of you who are you know, this is the entire 14 members of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals weighed in on this. And so one of them said, you know, what planet are these people living on? Makeup doesn't grow on trees. Hard to see why this isn't greater time and expense. Um, I think what really was going on in that case, as I read some of the accounts and I interviewed the lawyers who were involved, is the bartender was a lesbian. And she didn't look the part of someone who belonged in a casino. And she didn't argue it on those grounds, although she was represented by the lesbian um, rights movement. So, so it didn't surface in the opinion. But, but if you look at the photos and you interview the participants, um, you can see what was going on. And I think it made some terrible law as a consequence. But the court just wasn't ready to start going down that route and saying, what can and can't you have you know, require of casinos? And it didn't want to take on the whole sort of homophobic bias that underpins that industry. Yes? Um, it's all very interesting. I'm stumbling on, on the phrase of women of limited means. And how, yeah. on what basis should that possibly be decided? Um, yeah. And there are so many kind of, on a kind of, we're part of class, we're part of class, we're putting ourselves. So you know, we can put a dress code on people who feel more comfortable by you. Yeah, um, well, I think it brings me back to the analogy I was drawing earlier um, with race. Um, that was the same argument that was, you know, we have legitimate reasons to believe that people are just not going to buy those products or go to that restaurant if, um, uh, if, if, we f if you force us to desegregate uh, the workforce. 
And in a recent case, which I think really underscores it, Abercrombie and Fitch, some of you may know, was sued because it hired all American, which it also interpreted to be white, salespeople as the ones um, who projected the right image and said, and there's certainly plenty of marketing research to show, that people are more likely to buy from salespeople that they find attractive. Uh, they ended up settling that case because of the race discrimination. But would we really think it was a whole lot better if race wasn't a part of it and they just said, we're only going to have you know, white, thin women, which is, of course, the criteria that a lot of other department stores are now using. Um, I think it's what the law can do is not just to live up to our higher aspirations. And sure, there are some occupations where clearly appearances is essential because either sex is what's being sold, you know, think Playboy Bunny, um, or on television, a news broadcaster. I mean, that's, that's half the job right there. But I think we haven't really experimented with what the public's tolerance is for that. And you're starting to see more older women get on the news channels and have credibility. And I think if people got used to seeing that more, there wouldn't be such an aversive reaction. So, you know, I'm not overly optimistic in what the law can do, but I can tell you that just passing a statute is not a gold mine for lawyers and a real um, uh, burden for employers. It's just too costly for people psychologically and financially to bring these cases, and the damages at stake are, are, are rarely enough. So you're not going to see a whole lot of litigation. I think what you will see, though, is, is the most egregious cases and the ones that the media thinks are egregious getting some publicity and, I think, pushing um, customer norms. So, so that's the direction I'd like to see us moving. Yes? Well, I, you know, that's a good question, the generations, generations. I think that younger um, women have this kind of notion, I ought to be able to wear whatever I want in the workplace. Um, and, you know, we've seen it, and uh, um, they see it as an issue of agency. Um, and I'm with them part way. I'd like to get rid of the grooming codes that unnecessarily restrict their rights, but I think they haven't really experienced what my generation did, and probably your generation too, a kind of um, pervasive sex, um, uh, sex bias, and a real double whammy for women who didn't, quote, look professional. Um, and they are going to be punished for it. You can't have it both ways. And having women with a sexualized appearance in the workplace deflects attention from their, their workplace qualities. And even if they individually sometimes get a bump, it's not good for women generally if that's part of the hiring standards. Um, so I, I, I try to convince the students that they need to see it in a, in a more global, um, in more global terms. And eventually, it's going to come home to bite them because you know they're not all going to look like that um, in 20 years. And I don't think they'd want to be in a world in which that's going to cut against them when they try to get jobs when they, in fact, have more appearance, um, just less sex appeal. Yes? So as a, uh, so much has been made about the right of fighting against the flag, I'm sympathetic to what you're trying to do. I guess I have to admit, I'm surprised you used it as an example of a single contact. Maybe it's, you know, it's not a slide kind of thing, a single entendre, like you need to eat breasts and eat big breasts. As a, as we go to work at a restaurant and it's called Big Breasts, Uh, if you ask the Hooters waitresses, they all say, you know, they're here because the tips are better. And there was actually some recent research by a Cornell professor, God knows who pays for research like this, which found that big-breasted blonde women did get bigger tips as waitresses. <laughs> You know, there, there was a nice little press release in which he said, well, you know, I'm hoping that this will inform the waitressing industry you know, <laughs> as if this came as news. Um, yeah, but, you know, I, this is what I want to push the culture to rise above. Um, a cleavage is not necessary to serving burgers. And, you know, Southwest Airlines made exactly the same claim when it said we don't want to hire male flight attendants. 
because our male passengers like being served, and they had a whole advertising campaign, you know, fly me and fly Southwest with love, and you know, I mean, it was very sexualized imagery. Um, so it works, but I think we as a society say there are certain prejudices we don't want to cater to, and um, you know, what the airline, um, what the court said in those airline cases is they said, you know, this may be useful to your marketing, but the job of a flight attendant is safety and food service. And, you know, you, you don't need boobs to do that, um, uh, nor do you need high heels. So, um, so I think... Well, yeah. Um, uh, well, exactly. And that's why I fought for a picture of the shoe on the book cover. It's a deeper issue. Yes? Acting? Casting? Even in the case of acting, right? Gee, I don't know. The whole Hollywood <laughs> industry is, is kind of built around uh, cinematic appeal. Of, we, you know, face it, we all like to look at beautiful people up on that big screen. And, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm enough of a realist to think that's not going to sit well with, with the American people. And, you know, I mean, um, I'd like to start with the really egregious cases where you get consensus. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, saying, and Hollywood in casting pretty women cannot have Julia Roberts, it must have, you know, on a, I mean, it just, the story wouldn't work. Um, you know, so I think you get into um, some real problems if you build the prohibitions um, too strongly. Yes? You take them where? Uh-huh, Oregon. Counter stereotypes, yeah. Well, I'm all for social pressure um, to, to do it, and I'm all for the market to reward the people that do. And you know, the the case was sort of reminded me of um, of uh, a, actually a kind of public outcry when the Rockettes refused to hire a, a black woman because they said it would you know mar the aesthetics of the lineup. And people said, you know. Um, that's, that's way over the edge. So, so, and now when you see the Rockettes with a more racially and ethnically diverse lineup, it makes a statement to you, just like counter-stereotypical typical casting will do. Um, so I'm all for, for trying to convince um, uh, you know, the uh, theater and movie industry to do it and to try to break down some of the barriers that stand in the way, but you know, I'm, I'm a realist in how much you can do through law and how much you really need to do through market pressure and consumer support. Yes?
Yeah. Well, you know what? Yeah. yeah um, I won't try to get into the swimming suit picture, but <laughs> but but the question went to what impact do I think that women's increasing um, power and equality will have on beauty standards for men? Um, the problem that I see now in terms of pressures on men is that there's just a huge untapped financial market that's waiting to be tapped in the way that it's been tapped for women. And you see advertisers increasingly playing on the same anxieties that have led women um, down the path of excessive preoccupation and purchases, um, moving in some of the same directions. And so, you know, more men having plastic surgery um, and uh, buying um, what dermatologists call cosmetic hoo-ha. Um, so, so I'm not terribly optimistic to just sort of the push towards gender equality is going to deal with this particular problem as it affects men. And I think there are so many powerful financial forces um, working um, against a kind of reasonable cultural ideal that it's going to take some political pressure and social pressure. And in that, you know, the laws can play a small role as more as consciousness raising and the public lawsuits that get people to, you know, care about these issues are, are part of what can, can help push in the right direction. Um, yes? A couple of questions back, I think, brought this to an important bottom line. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can, I mean, obviously you've made a judgment about why this really is more likely to be a discrimination, and I'm wondering if you can talk more about that. You know, because those, because the characteristics that you just presented, intelligence, good humor, social skills, you know, those are relevant to job performance. Whereas just physical appearance, apart from the customer preference issue, isn't, you know. Okay, um, Well, yeah, and you know, I, I, I'm not claiming that the world is a perfect merit system but for this single thing, which at least if we could address. There are many ways in which the, you know, there are idiosyncrasies in hiring standards. We single out certain things like, I think, race or ethnicity or religion or disability because either there are things over which individuals have no control and things which we don't think in general are relevant to job performance. And those are the ones that we want to encourage people to you know, rise above. And it's not that we don't have some of the same reactions that you describe um, to people in the workplace. And certainly, you know, what prompted the whole Americans with Disability Acts was the fact that people do have revulsions against unattractive people appearing in certain service industries. There was in this country for many, many um, uh, centuries ugly laws, which actually prohibited people from appearing on the public streets um, uh, because they didn't conform to certain social norms. For a while, they were enforced against women who wouldn't wear their corsets outside. Um, you know, so, so we reflect our cultural prejudices and our um, and the ones that I think we most want people to rise above are the ones that have the least link um, to, to actual objective job performance as opposed to sort of subjective uh, customer preferences. And I grant you that's, you know, it's, it's not a sharp distinction, but that's, those are the places I think we want to draw the lines. Yes? Aren't there just as many discriminatory reactions to Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I mean, you have a certain amount of control over your accent. I'm more troubled when it's, you know, sort of um, there's a racial or religious bias connected with it. The reason why we don't like it is because that person sounds Hispanic. Just regional variations, even though some people may have those prejudices. You know, I don't think you can see systematic um, discrimination on that basis. It's true it's not going to help you in certain geographic areas if you're obviously from other dislike geographic areas. Yeah. So it's biased just to do that. But you say because you have a control, you can shift the focus. It's sort of the way to change the accent, you can shift the focus. Yeah, and I, I also don't think it's as systematic um, a problem. It doesn't reinforce group disadvantages in the way that appearance bias does. What other questions? Yes. Uh, well, uh, they're usually subject to reasonable grooming requirements. So employers can ban it, even in the jurisdictions that have bans on appearance discrimination. So interestingly enough, um, you know, uh, the case I cited of the um, a male pet supply worker in a warehouse was told he couldn't wear earrings. Or, you know, some fast food chains will say, you know, one piercing but not two in your ears. I mean, why Subway gets to make that distinction is, seems to me. So, you know, you can understand, I think, there's a legitimate concern about what's reasonable, you know, um, business attire. Um, uh, but I think uh, we ought to have, try to encourage employers to have somewhat greater tolerance um, for, for expression um, than, than we do. And certainly it's hard to understand the ban on male earrings without seeing some sort of homophobic underpinning to that. Yes? I think people get in um, a general way that folks get a beauty bump out there, but I don't think they realize the extent of it or um, how much it permeates even um, evaluations that you think ought to be based on, on merit. So a lot of the studies were, to me, illuminating. I mean, they actually can kind of quantify the wage penalty in certain industries for being overweight. Um, and, you know, just sort of the... Um, uh, people's degree of unconscious prejudice, you ask them, you know, you give them blind pictures and, you know, and resumes and inevitably, you know, even if it has, even if they have indications that the less attractive person's job performance is much better, they'll still pick the attractive person but yet deny that that's what's going on. So I don't think people have a clear sense of how pervasive um, the problem is. And, you know, it's kind of unsettling when you see again and again the surveys, like, you know, why should, student evalu why should you evaluate your students on the basis not of classroom performance but how they look? You know? um, it just isn't how you want the world to operate. Yes? Well, now in all but a handful of jurisdictions, you know, they're out of luck because that's a legitimate reason for, uh, for passing them over. In the jurisdictions that have the ordinances, um, they would have to show that that was the reason that they were passed over and that, but for that, they would have had the job and they suffered X amount of damages. It's not an easy kind of case oftentimes to prove because, you know, relatively few employers come right out and say it. Uh, but the cases in which they do are ones oftentimes you really would like to see the person win. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can prove it by things that the employers have said to other employees. So, you know, a, a woman who was uh, fired because she was six months pregnant, um, you know, the employer claimed that it was job related and some of the workers then testified that the manager had also said she's not the right look now for our lunchroom.
So, so sometimes you can prove it circumstantially. Yes. I, I work for an employer that gets a lot of uh, discrimination in many ways uh, for employees. And, and I'm wondering what you think, because I'm hearing what you have to say about there's this indication that, that I wouldn't want to work for this industry. And the thing that comes to my mind is that I'm not going to want to work for it. So what, I mean, I'm interested in these water schools and how that plays out with with the water schools, but you also say that you're thinking about discrimination Well, um, attorney's fees give people a reason for bringing the cases even when the damages aren't really substantial because no lawyer is going to take one of these cases now, generally speaking, because the damages aren't significant enough to justify it um, unless you know, there is some likelihood of attorney's fees or the person is rich enough and, and angry enough to actually pay the cost. And you know, so I think that Ideally, what you want is low-cost dispute resolution procedures, so this doesn't become a boondoggle for lawyers. Sorry, you know, I'm biting the hand that feeds me here, I know. But, but you know, I'd like to see justice get done in the least expensive way possible, and I think that's through a form of mediation or these commission remedies. And a number of the ordinances, a few of them provide for attorney's fees, most of them don't. Some limit relief in such a way that no wonder they have no complaints. You, you get such trivial damages, it doesn't. You know, they're too few to really draw, and you know, it's too hard to do the control. There are only six localities that have these, and, and uh, so, so I, I can't do it from my research. We'd need more ordinances. Yes, I think everything else we know in the, about how the legal world operates, though, does indicate that attorneys' fees are an incentive for people to bring suit, and with that comes both good cases and frivolous cases. I mean, the frivolous cases are part of the price we pay for having the good cases, and there the answer is sanctions. It's not to you know, prevent people from, from suit. Yes? They usually add it in. Yeah, well, the book gives you all the ordinances and tells you that, but in, you know, they vary. Some say just height and weight. Some say it has to be a Nate appearance. That's Santa Cruz, a Nate characteristic, because they didn't want all the piercings and the tattoos and that stuff to creep in. Um, some just say appearance generally. That's the District of, of Columbia. Um, and, you know, the ones that have the appearance generally, they have exceptions for reasonable grooming requirements that, Courts interpret liberally to protect employers from what they consider to be unreasonable complaints. Yes, and then we all take two more questions and then stay around to sign books and answer questions that anyone else has. Right. It's an industry-wide standard because what they found was when they instituted that, it dramatically affected the number of women musicians that got through. And it was so astonishing um, that it, that became the industry norm. And now, of course, it protects people on the basis of race and uh, ethnicity and appearance generally. But um, you know, all those people who thought they were just listening were, in fact, looking as well. And um, yes, I'll give you the final question. Courtship selection? <laughs> you know, I don't want to go there. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's, you, you know, we're kind of hardwired there to, um, and so people are going to have uh, deep-seated reactions based on appearance that 
I think have pretty strong biological, sociobiological roots. You know, I'm much more interested in trying to deal with it in the areas where I think we as a society more legitimately are concerned with people picking on the basis of merit, not sexual attractiveness. And, and, and so those are the ones. You know, I'll just leave you with one story. When I was doing um, you know, some interviews with the book, I did a lot of talk shows on NPR, and one of the ones I did was Michael Krasny, who some of you may know is the local Bay Area talk show host. He's a very thoughtful interviewer. And he said toward the end, he said, you know, um, I got to say, I was in a restaurant the other day, and this guy with, uh, you know, real facial, you know, problems, um, skin stuff, and just, you know, and it really wasn't conducive to, to you know, a, a, a restaurant food atmosphere. You know, it just kind of took away my appetite. And that's what the Americans Against Disability Act was passed to overcome. Do we really want to say that guy can't have a job because because um, you have this kind of prejudicial aversive reaction? Seems to me that's what we're asking people to rise above. You know, let's live up to our better sense of self and let's use the law to the extent that we can to push people in in that direction. And you know, sort of um, uh, that's where my hope is, and not necessarily through law, but through social consciousness, through normalizing a broader range of acceptable appearances, um, maybe move towards a more tolerant society and ones in which you have fewer people suffering um, all the kinds of physical injuries and self-esteem and humiliation, and oftentimes loss of jobs and, and promotion opportunities because of a characteristic that really doesn't have anything to do with so, so on that hopeful note, thank you all very much for joining us. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.